Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, good to see so many of you. Yesterday was a very long day. We crashed with the art crash course sort of nearly into midnight. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a hard crash. Um, Today will be a somewhat, a somewhat lighter day. That is the, that's the good news. We have the closing session is until 5, and, and that everything looks like we should be able to make it. So, uh, so that leaves some time for uh, some of you to uh, relax after that and for some others of you to work very hard on the spatial prediction contest. Uh, we have, so this morning, uh, the only program you have this morning is the four, uh, the four speakers who will do sessions. Today they're going to introduce uh, their topic. Um, there is 20 minutes in the program, but if, if you need more, it's okay. If you need less, that's also okay. Then we just have a somewhat longer coffee break, which, you know, it's... Sounds awesome. ...has also <laughs> value in itself. Yeah. Our first speaker is Anita Graser. Could you introduce yourself or something? Of course, yeah, I can introduce myself. Uh, <laughs> thanks again for inviting me over. Uh, it's my first time at this summer school, and I have to get a confession out of the way. I'm a Python person. Uh, so also this workshop, if you attend it, will be in Python, but I hope it's structured in a way that it's not a problem, even if you haven't done much with Python before. So my research focus at the AIT is in analyzing movement data, and that's also what the workshop is about. Uh, we are analyzing all kinds of movement data, from human movement to vehicle movement, movement of goods, uh, in order to make suggestions to improve logistics flows. So that's the background of my research. And today I want to present you a bit of the background first of why I started developing the Moving Pandas library. So moving pandas, unfortunately, has nothing to do with these guys, even though that would be really cool. But we don't do much animal movement research, unfortunately. If you have data on them anyway, I, I would love to have a moving pandas tutorial with panda data. That, that would be awesome. Instead, it's about this pandas. So it's about the data analysis library of Python that is called pandas. And the motivation, as I said already a bit, is that I, we get a lot of different movement data sets all the time for different projects. And getting a feel for the data, exploring it, doing those first steps that you have to do before uh, you can decide in which direction you uh, want to continue investigating, is always some degree of awful because there are no standard tools that you can just plug your data in and have a look at it. So I have summarized a couple of the issues that I regularly encounter in the blog post that is linked here in the bottom. And it just, uh, I just keep on developing this whole series about movement data in GIS and beyond. Uh, but mainly, usually you want to extract some of the key features of the movement data. So from this hairball of trajectories that you get when you visualize the incoming uh, points and you connect the consecutive points, you maybe want to extract the origins and the destinations from this data set and find out what are the most common uh, origin destination pairs or you might want to uh, calculate the travel times between those. So tools that can help you get there faster are what's needed, I think. And one of the big challenges that I've faced is the conceptual one. Like, what, what is movement data and how should it be modeled? On the one hand side, it's geographic, of course, because the movement happens somewhere. And of course, it's also temporal, because there is a sequence of the locations, which is very important in the analysis. So you could either look at it as uh, geographic features with timestamps, as we do so often in the GIS world, or you could look at it at a, as a time series of locations. So on the right-hand side, you see one of the examples I think I took that one from the uh, OGC moving uh, features standard, this short uh, comma-separated value example, uh, which 
can be inter interpreted either way. So it could be a time series or it could just be points with, with timestamps. So before starting to develop Moving Pandas, I looked into what's out there already. And one thing I spent quite a lot of time on was the, the GIS, the usual GIS approach. And the approach that is used in spatial databases as, such as post-GIS. Then I also looked uh, into uh, Etzer's R package for trajectories, what they have been doing there. And I also looked into what uh, computer scientists do, because there's this whole field of uh, moving object databases, which is also really interesting on one hand, and on the other side, uh, a little frustrating, because there are no established tools. It's all research prototypes, which are fit for teaching, which I think means they are not fit for production. I don't know, but that's what they say on their website. So as a GIS person, I, the, the natural reaction to movement data is, yeah, let's make a map, and the GIS certainly can deal with some kinds of movement data analysis. And yes, you can write SQL statements that can create trajectories out of the points. You just have to take care of always grouping by the object IDs and sorting by the timestamps and doing that every time that you want to uh, create an analysis. So the SQL statements that you need to write to do anything uh, in a spatial database starting from the movement points are rather annoying and long and get complicated. So there's different approaches that you can do in a GIS. If you have movement data, you can have points or segments between consecutive points. And they can be timestamped. They have, can have additional attributes. But the large issue is that there is no built-in logic that ensures that you always get the points in the right chronological order for your analysis or really anything else. So you have to always have some additional application logic that knows these points with timestamps are actually part of a trajectory and should be treated like they belong together. And the GIS itself doesn't really help you much with that. The other approach is you can, of course, connect all the points that belong to the same trajectory into a line. Then you have the correct order of points because that's fixed, but then you run into the issue that you cannot save uh, attributes to each individual location anymore because you can only save attributes for the whole line string. The only exception here is you can save one attribute to each node using the line string m or measure variable, which I have experimented with. Actually, post-GIS has this trajectory support where the concept is that you put the timestamp as an integer into the M uh, measure. So you can do some things with this approach, but there's only one M measure for whatever reason, and that's already used up by the timestamp, so you cannot store any other attributes anymore with the nodes. So you cannot store the recorded speed at the location, you cannot store any other context information that all would have to go into a separate table maybe, or. Yeah, it gets complicated. It's not a good approach. In our trajectories, although Etzer would certainly be better to tell you, better qualified to tell you about how that works, uh, but they also store uh, spatial points. And if you need to visualize the trajectory, you can also access the connections between the points to get a, a better view of the data than if you just plot the individual points, of course. But basically, it's also um, more focused on the geographic, I think, than on the time. One interesting thing, the computer scientists that do uh, movement da uh, moving object databases is do that they don't just have linear interpolation between points. So I think both uh, trajectories and the post-GIS trajectories they always assume that there is a linear connection between the one point and the other point. In contrast, uh, in moving object databases, uh, the researchers actually go the extra way and specify for each segment what kind of connection uh, happens on this uh, slice, 
as they call it. So you can have linear movement between consecutive points, or you can have arc movement or constant movement. And this allows you to uh, reduce the, the data set size uh, considerably if you perform the appropriate preprocessing steps first. Uh, so this is taken from the, the documentation of the Hermes database, which is developed by uh, the University of Piraeus. And they have extensions for Oracle and for PostGIS, if you're interested. They do share their work. Uh, but there's also a separate one here from, from Germany, which um, is also... Uh, they don't even use a standard database as a... Uh, baseline for extension, they have built the whole thing uh, from the ground up as a teaching database where you can have your students experiments with all kinds of things. So these have been the approaches that are out there and that I looked into of how to model the data, but of course that's only half of the story because the other part of the story is once you have the trajectory stored in some way or other, you also want to analyze them. So the question is what kind of functions for analyzing this data should you include in a library like that? And there is, first of all, of course, functions that work on individual trajectories. And I think they are essential, and those are the ones that I have so far mostly implemented in Moving Pandas. And then there's a whole range of uh, functionality that you would apply to pairs of trajectories or groups of trajectories, um, which give you more advanced capabilities as well. And f of course, there's a lot of uh, data manipulation and housekeeping functionality that you will also need to work efficiently. So let's just have a quick look to give you an impression of uh, what kind of functionality uh, I'm talking he about here. So there are uh, spatial primitives. So the question here would be, I have a given time, and I want to know where the object was at that given time. And PostGIS and uh, Hermes, they, they call it differently, but they both have these functions. Either locate along for one timestamp or locate between for two timestamps if you want to extract a segment between two timestamps. The other way around, you could also have uh, the question, given a location, when was the object at this location? So that would be interpolate point or add point. You also have questions about uh, the distances that are, have been traveled, the directions, of course, and the extent of the whole trajectory. Um, one thing that's interesting maybe to note here is that particularly uh, the, the Hermes database, they have often two functions that are called uh, similarly. So there is F direction and there is also just direction. And the direction function would just give you the overall movement direction from the starting point of the trajectory to the end point. So it's like a global perspective. And then there is this F direction, which you have to supply with a timestamp, which gives you the local movement direction at this one timestamp. So that's maybe something to keep in mind, that the same function can have two different meanings depending on the implementations. Of course, there's also overall di duration, and then it's always convenient to have some uh, utility functions that compute speed, uh, velocity of the trajectory, which again can be local between two points or a global or something in between if you have moving averages, for example. On the other hand, if we move into groups of trajectories, there are really a lot of uh, examples in the literature of what you might want to implement here. The most obvious is always to have uh, distances or similarity measures between trajectories so you can cluster them, uh, find groups, maybe extract the, the central movement uh, axis of the group so you can reduce the data set size. Then, of course, you want to have some descriptive statistics, like how many trajectories do you have, what area do they cover, what's the density, or things like formation, is there flocking behavior or dispersal behavior, um, mostly from the movement ecology sides. And also, you can even compare different groups of trajectories. They could be different uh, groups of animals, flocks, 
do they move together and uh, separate in the same group again, or do they intermingle, for example? So, as I already said, these uh, group uh, or functions for multiple trajectories are currently not implemented in moving and pandas yet, uh, but I wanted to include them anyway in this overview so that you get a bigger picture of the topic. Uh, the functions I want to end with are the data manipulation function, and they sound kind of basic, but you would be surprised how tricky something like even a clip or intersect can be with a library that's not built for moving uh, object data. For example, I had a master's student whom I asked to do intersection work with post-GIS trajectories and land use polygons. And uh, the first thing she uh, realized was, yeah, PostGIS can do an intersect of a line string M with a polygon, but the intersection has lost all its M values because as the intersection drops the M values. So you lose all your timestamps from your movement data, yay. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Uh, anyway, it's really complicated to restore the time information afterwards. And... Uh, yeah, it's something I did not expect. I hadn't tried it before. I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea for a master thesis. Try that. And then we run into those problems. Um, also, of course, you need range queries to do a spatial filtering of the data. PostGIS has this, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but this triple ampersand filter that's uh, n-dimensional index. And that can take time, uh, can take account of the, the time and the space of your data set. So that's, that's really quick if you want to filter in PostGIS on spatial temporal data. Any spatial temporal data doesn't have to be movement data, could also be something else. Then some tools already implement things like nearest neighbor queries, which is of course also very nice. And uh, downsampling and generalization is also something that uh, I have already started implementing because I think that's really useful as well. And not to be underestimated the challenges of coordinate systems, like we already discussed yesterday, which will only get worse in the future, um, and visualization. So unfortunately, particularly the computer science people are not so much into visualizations. They are happy to have their data in their database. They don't need to look at it. So if you want to look at it, you can always export it in some GeoJSON file and then do whatever you want, but it's not really their main objective. So that can get a bit tricky if you use something from that direction. So why did I end up with Pandas as the base for my development? Pandas has been developed in the context of financial modeling. So they spent a lot of time on getting, working with time series right. So since I wanted to do, or since I wanted to try this approach of looking at the movement data as a time series of locations, this seemed like a, a natural fit, particularly since there is already an extension for pandas, which is called GeoPandas, and which allows you to store geometries in the data frame. These geometries can be points, lines, polygons. So theoretically, we could even try do some um, moving ob uh, aerial moving object work with this. I haven't looked into that yet. Currently, I'm still looking at point objects that move in space. But theoretically, the combination with GeoPandas would enable us to have aerial objects that change shape over time and move over time. And we should be able to model that as well, which would be really exciting in the future to try. These are just some of the core functions that are included in the, um, in the trajectory class so far. Um, so you will see all of these and more in the, in the workshop. And of course, you can also look into the repo if you're interested. And... For all those who just see the code right now and who will maybe not attend the workshop, I included a couple of lines of how, the, how it works. Uh, here, the, the first and the last line, really, you can ignore that, those are just for taking the time. And then I have one line for reading the data from GeoPackage format. The read file for, uh, function is already provided by GeoPandas, so nothing to implement there. 
then I just need uh, to take care of setting the index on the time uh, column. Uh, and I can read the data like a normal geodata frame and plot it. Uh, here they are plotted with different colors for the trajectory IDs, so you can see it goes from one to five. I have five trajectories in this data set. And then if I want to construct my trajectories, I just do a group by the trajectory ID on the data frame, and then I construct my trajectory objects out of that. And the output you can see here is the basic summary output that you get if you print the trajectory object to string. So it has a, a WKT string, and it tells you when the trajectory started and how long it is, and how many points are in each trajectory. So here, the first one has 466 nodes, and the longest one has over 1,800 nodes. And then you can use the same function that we had before, but before the points were just points with timestamp information, and now you actually have trajectory objects which have a linear representation and can be visualized with the speed along the trajectory with three lines of code, basically. And I just want to add one last example, which uh, I thought was really showing how helpful this approach of looking at movement as a time series can be. Uh, and that was based on a discussion on Twitter where someone said, uh, could this be used for precision agriculture? And then I asked, what exactly do you mean? And he brought this example of this uh, potato harvester. So they are tracking the potato harvester and they're also counting how many potatoes are extracted. But the counting happens a couple of seconds after the machine has passed the location from where it extracts the potatoes because there's this conveyor belt and somewhere at the end of the conveyor belt the counting happens. So if you just match the timestamps of the countings and the timestamps of the location, you get it shifted. Uh, so there is in uh, pandas already this shift function that you can apply with an offset in any kinds of units, one second, 50 seconds. And it's really just this one line of code which lets you rearrange the whole data so the counts align with the actual position of when the potatoes were extracted from the soil. Instead, if you think of how you would do that in a, in a GIS, particularly if you don't have regularly sampled data where you have one position every second and one count every second, but where those can be differently spaced, I think you realize that can cause quite some headaches and certainly not be solved as elegantly as just writing one line of code. So in the workshop, we will have three notebooks to work with. The first one will give you an introduction to the pandas trajectory moving pandas trajectory class. And then I have two more applied notebooks. One will look into ship analysis data, uh, ship data analysis. And the second example will be a bird migration data, which we can look at together to explore how the library works. And if you have movement data yourself, we can also try to, to work with that. So I'm certainly looking forward to all your feedback there as well. Thank you very much. OK, well, thank you, everybody. For, thank you for inviting me. So I work at Citizen Netherlands, uh, and we uh, produce a lot of maps, especially Coroplath, of course, where you have like per municipality or neighborhoods, postal code, whatever, like the, for instance, the employment rate, etc. Um, and then yeah, I'll talk about the history a couple of minutes uh, after this slide. Uh, so, in a sense, I create a package to to make those maps in a nice and elegant way. And it's called TMap. So there are a couple of ways in which you can make maps in R. Um, I have listed four of them. So either generic plot function, which is by the, 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 the methods, spatial uh, class packages like SF, raster, SP, etc. They all have a plot function. Uh, ggplot2. Uh, you could over, uh, in the past you could make maps of it with it, but it was really a little bit troublesome in some ways. Uh, but recently they improved a lot, especially with the geom SF. Uh, there's this leaflet package, which is really great. 
uh, it's for interactive maps only. And it requires a little bit of work. But on the other hand, you have a lot of flexibility. And it's really fast to, uh, to load. Uh, and there's MapView, really an excellent package to explore spatial objects. So just for my curiosity, whom of you have used TMAP before? OK. Yeah, so what I will do in the workshop, I'll mainly focus on TMAP, of course, because like, I wrote it. But I also focus on, like also in this presentation, about the differences between, um, between the other um, plotting packages. So what are the benefits of it, which one to use. And the thing about TMAP is that I want to have like a ggplot kind of style to create maps, but purely focus on maps. So when you plot the map, the basic layout should be like good, good. Whereas in ggplot2, it's like, OK, I have this, this figure of a shape, the world shape. Uh, it, it isn't exactly a map, if you know what I mean. I mean, for scatter plots, good. But so I thought, OK, there's something missing. Um, and yeah, it works fluently with all kinds of spatial objects, like I said. Uh, and what they also added a couple of years ago is like two modes. So plot mode and view mode. So one for static maps and one for interactive maps. So this is basically the summary of the package. So about the history, like I said, in 2014, we gave like a course in data visualization and R at our office. And I created some wrapper functions together with a colleague, Edwin de Jonge. And then it grew out of hand, and I make, made a package called GeoNL, so which had like generic functions for the Netherlands. And I thought, why the Netherlands only? <laughs> I mean, so I thought, okay, let's make a package Geo, uh, which I also added like um, ggplot2 kind of approach to it. I submitted it to Chrome. It was accepted, but I had to be renamed because Geo was too general. So I renamed it to TMAP, thematic map. Uh, however, I had to rename all the functions. So I had like uh, geo polygons, geo lines, et cetera, et cetera. So I had to rename it all to TM uh, polygons, TM lines, et cetera. Uh, so then there was this first release of TMAP 2015. I thought, OK, let's uh, submit it to Journal Statistical Software. It took a while. The, the writing process took like a year and then the review period, two years. Uh, quite nice. I got two um, reviewers, the really nice feedback. And then I submitted it, OK, it's good. And then they forgot to send me the third review. And it was actually the author of Matthew. And he had really good points. One point is to, uh, to take away the functions that are nothing to do with plotting. Uh, but helper functions to another package, uh, so which I called TMAP tools. So in a sense, it makes the package even better. And that's also the point I want to make during this workshop, that uh, the community really helps a lot in developing the package. So they really ask good questions like, why did, did you do that? Couldn't you do that? And that's like, no, I couldn't do that. Well, maybe. Yeah, of course I could do that. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. That's, that's a uh, good thing about it. So uh, it's 2018, then also last uh, version 1. Then version 2, I migrated to SF. Um, and recently, I had the Shiny integration, which I also explained in the workshop, of course. But yeah, basically, I guess all of the R users know ggplot2. So, mm, in a sense, the, the stacking of the objects is really similar. However, it's a little bit different. In GG, the function ggplot, you only define the data and aesthetics. Um, and in the tmap, you have like a tm shape, in which you basically specify the shape object. Yeah, shape, I call it yeah, it's just like a spatial object, it's either SF roster. Um, and you can also like specify the, the coordinate reference system, bounding box, etc. But the aesthetics you have to define on the layer functions like TM polygons, TM lines, TM roster, etc. Uh, facets works like similarly, a little bit different, of course. But 
Um, so a couple of small examples. So here's like a data set world. Uh, so you define the spatial objects and I say, okay, I want polygons, just polygons. Um, or I want polygons colored blue, blue, but instead of color, you can also name a variable, variable in the name, like income group, and it automatically creates a color path. And similar for a bubble map, uh, you do like, this is a point data frame, uh, point, sp spatial points, metro, met metropolitan areas. You do like, uh, oh, it should be an enter over here, but TM shape metro plus TM bubbles with these as size. And you can also like add color. So this is the size aesthetic, color aesthetic, and combine it. So you have the color path, the bubble map. So now I show the map itself. So this is the map. So I have like this, this color path with one aesthetic, the fill color, and uh, a bubble map with two aesthetics, the size of the bubbles and the color. And of course, you can specify the palettes, the, the, the sizes of the bubbles, the scale, the breaks, whatever you want. So uh, if you look at the, the, the documentation of TM bubbles, you might be a little bit intimidated by the number of uh, arguments. Um, there are a lot more than GDPLOT2 because it's a little bit differently arranged. However, I try to name the arguments such that it's very logical, like legend dot. It's all related to the legend, then, uh, and then, of course, the most important ones at the top. Yeah, so uh, these, these two plot modes, then you can like switch immediately between like static and interactive. And why did I do that? Because sometimes you want static maps, sometimes you want interactive maps. I mean, depending on whether you want publication or you want exploration. For exploration, you often use like interactive mode. So there's two the function, so it's a function team, team map mode. But I'm lazy myself, so I thought, OK, let's make an as short as possible function in which you toggle the mode. So let's t toggle thematic map. So that's this thing. So if I do TTM and then um, and then you get this map. So it's an interactive map, also based on leaflet. Uses leaflet. So uh, yeah, that's it. Then that's then I have some styles, so it's a little bit more hobby project. But there's a couple of styles um, in which you define like the, the the default color schemes, the font, all those things. So I have like I think a couple of them, and you can define your own your own style. So if you have like an house theme or like a logo that you always want, etc., then you can create your own style. <coughs> uh, yeah, and there's also like the thing like TM underscore compass or scale bar and that, that kind of thing. So all these map attributes, which you typically don't find in thing, uh, plotting in packages like ggplot2. So facets, it can be arranged in a couple of methods. So you can specify like multiple variables. So for instance, a happy planet index and a GDP uh, per capita, and then you have like two maps. But you can also do it by group by. So in this case, it's point data. This data set is available as a supplement to this GSS paper. Uh, the link you can find on the GitHub page, which is in the Google Calendar. Um, so TM shape crimes underscore city, so all crimes in London City. It just plays a dot with no aesthetics. And TM facets group by crime type. So you see the crimes per crime type. Um, yeah, free coordinates is like similar to skills dot uh, skills is free, which you have in uh, ggplot two. Um, yeah, so in this case yeah, you can have like this um, Background tiles, either download, I think it's the package OpenStreetMap, which have like a roster of these background tiles. Of course, if you have interactive maps, you can uh, have this leaflet providers and all kind of uh, tile servers which you can use, but also overlay. So you can also have like a background map 
in interactive mode at least, uh, the, the, the polygons and then the labels on top. So that, that, that kind of things are possible. So there are several output functions like TM safe, TMAP safe, similar to GG safe, but a little bit different. Um, you can also save it as a website. If you do it like HTML, then you just save the interactive a map. Uh, TM animation, I think I have an example, I'm not sure. No, no, anim yeah, so TM an animation is just animated uh, static maps. Uh, shiny integration, uh, yeah, I'll talk through it in the workshop, of course, but like the TM output, render TM map, TM map proxy. Uh, one side note, of course, that TM map is, and that's also the difference between leaflet and map view, uh, TM map is a little uh, heavyweight because it's like for a high level package. It has a large dependency tree, and it's a tad slower to load or to reload than if you use plain leaflet maps. So it could be, so for some applications, for some dashboard, TMAP is perfect. For others, I would recommend either leaflet or map view. Uh, and that's also this, this slide. So uh, yeah, which package should you use? Uh, depends on, of course, your needs. Uh, so if you're familiar with Gplot2, you don't care about other learning other uh, plotting packages. And also interactive maps, although I think ggplotly you can have like interactive maps. Uh, yeah, you can, you can of course use uh, ggplot2. Um, if you want like interactive maps and have as many flexibility as possible and as fast loaded as possible, then you can go with leaflet. It requires more code especially like legends and breaks and that kind of things. And, uh, if you just want to explore the, um, um, spatial objects, so you don't want to have like a core plot and that kind of thing, but just, uh, just want to explore it, the map view is better. So map view can also do, of course, core plots or like, and vice versa, um, tmap can also, you can also explore spatial objects with tmap, it's a function QTM, which is kind of similar to map view. But I think it's a diff different approach, different. I think the main benefit of team, team app is like educational purposes. So it's well structured, I think. If not, let me know. Um, yeah, that's, so yeah, this is a summary basically. So it's a powerful package um, based on ggplot, but a little bit different, of course. Uh, so easy to understand syntax. Many options to configure the map, like. Uh, layouts and stuff like that. So two modes that you can interactive. Um, and what's important, what I already said, is that uh, the use are key. So I've list this quite active. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, this is the the, the 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 site of the the workshop, which is in the Google Calendar, which with links of this presentation. Uh, come to that later. Uh, so yeah, this is the GitHub page of TMAP. Uh, and there are like many issues and uh, the thing is, if people ask me questions like, I didn't expect this behavior, what's wrong? It could be a bug, but it could also be that it's not well documented. So it's also for me a sign like, okay, maybe I should write it a little bit differently in the documents. So there is also, yeah, in the workshop, there's also a link to uh, Book of Robin and others. Uh, so there's a chapter about uh, spatial data visualization in R. Uh, and that's uh, oh, it's a bit slow, but OK. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, it's a quite a good introduction, and a lot of it is Steam map, but there are also other packages that are covered. Uh, so yeah, that's that's also nice, uh, nice material. And yeah, questions like Stack Overflow GitHub. So I think that's it. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Like this map um, for polygons. This one, a large map of that. Where is it? Yeah. I don't have an open mm, view image. Okay, yeah. Uh, so this one was already quite challenging to load. It's, it, it takes a couple of seconds. It was like a couple of thousand uh, uh, counties in, uh, in the US. Uh, and especially interactive, it's, it's okay. It's okay nowadays. Uh, for raster images, um, there is an options um, like a limit, and if you pass a limit, it is uh, downsized automatically in order to, to show it, uh, yeah, to show it fast with fast response times, etc. But I think. If you encounter problems regarding that, let me know, and then I can like benchmark. I still on my to-do list to make the performance a little bit better in terms of computation time. But if you have like problems with it, I can try to benchmark it. And okay. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, Markus Nettler, my name. I'm from Bonn and uh, involved in the GraphJS development already for a long time, like uh, 97 coordinating the stuff and 93 being a user, started at university exploring the software and uh, the session today is about uh, how to analyze environmental data with uh, GraphJS. I didn't prepare slides for today because I'm just back from the Phosphor-G conference in uh, in Bucharest, but I think you can see it like this as well. So, um, what I prepared, is the font size okay for everyone, or should I enlarge it? Okay, maybe like this. Um, so, we have different sections. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, who is already uh, familiar with uh, GraphJS in a way. Maybe you can give a sign. Okay, so we are not alone. There are <laughs> quite some. Uh, still, uh, since not everyone is familiar with that, there's a chapter on, on uh, GraphJS basics. Uh, there are a few concepts you have to know, not too many, but uh, just a few, like two or three and then uh, everything will go smooth if you are already familiar with GIS in general. Otherwise, just read what's written here. Uh, we will go through that in our session today. Then I brought an extract of the European Climate Assessment data set, uh, which is a time series, a daily time series of climatic data starting in, uh, on 1st of January uh, 1950. So it's really a long one. Um, and we will do some data aggregation, statistics, time series, processing, and so forth on it. The next chapter is uh, doing classification with uh, machine learning using, in this case, the random uh, forest classifier. There's an interface. It is using Python for that. Uh, the GRASS software, it is related to an external Python software. And uh, still, it is integrated like an add-on, so it feels like a grass command to you. And eventually, uh, we have linear and multiple regression examples. This is rather simple, but the idea is to give you an overview of what's possible, and then for your own research, you can naturally do more. Uh, this also includes some interfacing with R, because you have uh, the bidirectional possibility of exchanging data, doing processing, uh, in grass, send data to R, do processing there, get retrieve results back, and so forth. So the idea is, of course, to use the best tools you can have and to interface them as much as possible. And finally, uh, probably we won't have time for that, but those being interested in uh, using Python and grass, there's a very easy to use extension called uh, grass session. Like this, you can uh, use uh, R, uh, grass in a 
Pythonic way, which means that you can write your scripts, you can call functionality uh, of GraphJS where it suits you and uh, return back to your workflow. So it is not needed to only work in Grass itself. Yeah, I wrote uh, two lines about myself. Um, for those not knowing me, uh, I'm, I'm from Germany, but I was working for 15 years in research in Trento in Italy and then moved in 2016 uh, to Bonn uh, in order to uh, co-found with two other uh, colleagues, Mundialis, that's an open source company. And yeah, we are meanwhile luckily overwhelmed with work, which is nice. And uh, we also work in research, so we do H Horizon 2020 projects, some German research projects, uh, we were part of the consortia there, but we of course do also B2B, uh, which is business to business, means uh, we are working uh, for different companies like uh, German Telecom. I had a presentation at Bucharest about uh, fiber optics planning. Uh, we are developing together with other companies an open source solution for the German Telecom, and of course it is also GrassJS based. There's a second a set of talks uh, from my side about Actinia cloud processing. I think I will pros uh, show that in the respective plenary, but uh, it is uh, using GrassJS as a backend. So if you come today, you will naturally be uh, have an advantage to follow the other section. So just, I don't know how many minutes I have. Okay, um, just to look into the details. Quickly, just goes going through um, some GrassGIS basics. I'm also uh, often point to not reinvent the wheel, pointing to uh, different um, web pages here. One example, just to show you the academic impact of this software. Of course, inspired by the R project, where they did something similar. Uh, we came up with. Uh, Grass development team page here, you can see at time 34,000 citations, luckily searched in an automated way. And uh, yeah, if you are interested in looking at what has been published so far uh, or what is using Grass and so on, uh, there's a way to find out. Yeah, the concepts of uh, region and so on I will introduce in this, um, in this session then. We have some database structure to know about. This is also relevant for this cloud processing. I will show uh, in, uh, soon in the other uh, presentation. Data workflow and so on, and a couple of uh, commands we are looking into. The second part is the analysis of the climatic data. Again, I use an extract of an of uh, this ECAT data set plus some other data and uh, why extract because they are pretty heavy. I think there are now about 30,000 layers in a single file being distributed and uh, just to be a bit faster, um, yeah, we will, we will just use this subset here. I put all the commands we use here. You can also use the graphical user interface as well. So if you are scared of command line, but probably you are not because uh, it is not that dramatic and it's giving you a lot of advantages. Um, then uh, you find the details here, all the different steps, and then we go through and do some uh, statistical analysis on top. So no, I don't want to show this in detail now. Image classification with machine learning. This is naturally not a machine learning course, but it's just using some uh, tools here in order to uh, reproduce the Köppen-Geiger um, classic, uh, climatic classification. Yeah, you are, have probably heard of it or you're using it yourself. This is something you can derive yourself uh, defining some rules. The rules are pretty complex. Um, we will not uh, retrieve them here, but uh, we do some simplified way. The regression, yeah, linear multiple regression you may be familiar with. Here are some examples. Um, 
the interface to R we uh, have uh, nicely explained in the wiki. There's a wiki of uh, Grass GIS, and here you find installation for Windows, Linux, and so on, uh, and the use different use cases, set of examples, and uh, useful links. The real expert is sitting over there, so I will not dive into details here. Um, and eventually connecting Grass and Python. Um, there are more than, I think, 70 scripts and a uh, major part of the, or not major, but a significant part of the library is written in Python. In Grass, we just made the migration to uh, Python 3, which was uh, overdue. Uh, the version 7.8 is coming with Python 3 support, and uh, since then we hope to... Uh, yeah, to be compliant again with the rest of the world because Python 2 is end of life, uh, more or less end of the year, and uh, that was a necessary change. And I'm talking here about uh, 270,000 lines of Python we had to check, so that is not anything which you do uh, in an afternoon. Yeah, Grass Session, you can just uh, install this with pip. Pip install Grass Session, and then you can... Uh, import a few libraries and then you can go ahead and do your processing here. Uh, we show some examples. Here are some more details as well. And um, that is this part here. Yeah, with that I would like to conclude. Um, hope to see you all later in the session. And floor back to Etza. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, my session today is, it's got a kind of complicated title that I've struggled with a bit, but computational graphic structures for geospatial data. And really the point is that a lot of the geospatial data we use can be really compellingly modelled in a different mode in, in gaming types and in computational graphic structures. Um, and I've learned a lot about this sort of slowly over the years. I've worked with people in the past who knew this back to front, and I've sort of slowly learnt my way around this in R. Um, there's really powerful 3D visualisation in R, called in the RGL package, um, and I've been really interested to find what are the pathways we can use to get from geospatial and, and leverage those tools. Because um, certainly for me it was not obvious, and it took, it took a lot of the time I just thought it doesn't work at all, but there were a few little tricks that I, I finally realised that I was missing. Um, So there's a little bit of a setup. So if you're actually doing the workshop, I'd hope that you can run a few lines of code. It, it, it makes sure we have some packages ready and some data downloaded that we'll use. So please just let me know if you have problems with that. Um, it doesn't take too long, but it'd be great if you can try that before the workshop. Um, and I did have to fix a bug in one of my own packages this morning uh, from GitHub. So if you have problems with installing stuff from GitHub, don't worry about that part so much. Um, We'll still discuss the concepts in detail and, and talk about it. There's, um, there's, there's really three sections. Oh, so here's the getting set up. So there's a link to this book resource in the, in the calendar for the event. Um, getting set up is really it's making sure we've got a bunch of packages installed from CRAN. Um, it's written in this slightly abstract way because it just it won't reinstall stuff if you've already got it. Um, there's a couple of my packages off GitHub to install, and they should go straight forward if, if all these above do as well. Um, there's a download of, a, of an R data session file, just with data objects I use in the session. Um, and there's also an image that I get download. So there's this freely available image of the world and, and that gets used as a, as a texture on a surface in part of the workshop. These are a few functions that I use in the book itself, so you probably won't need those, but they're harmless. Um, there's three sections. I'm going to talk about 3D and mesh forms of spatial data. I'm going to talk about and how it really relates to geospatial and some of the concepts I think we need to have. <coughs> I'm going to talk about the mesh 3D format in, in RGL, which is a really powerful way of having an object with 
both its sort of geometry and its topology, its, its, its material properties, like its colours and, it, and the way it presents when you plot it in a 3D scene. Um, and, and the different primitive types that are available with that. So there's, there's quads and there's triangles. Um, lines have to be decomposed to segments, but RDL doesn't really have a, a, a formal type for that. So again, that's one of these little obstacles in the way where things don't kind of work out in the, in the obvious way you'd think. Um, and then I've got some techniques for transforming our regular spatial data, so rasters and lines and polygons and getting them into RGL forms and understanding how that works. Uh, and then there's this, there'll be sections on just exercises and examples that we can work through together. Uh, some of the key concepts that I gave this talk at Phosphor G Oceania last year. Um, it was one of the first times I'd really presented these ideas. Like, they're not like mysterious ideas, but there just really isn't a crossover in our communities. And I'm I'm really hoping to find more people that can that are interested in in, in exploring this area and understanding how we we cross these these different types of data. So the key questions are what are meshes and topology? And I've had a lot of conversations here where the, when we, like topology means a bunch of different things. If you talk to mathematicians, it's, it's quite different. Usually in GIS, we're talking about the old ArcNode topology model in, in ArcGIS. But here I'm really talking about a, a broader than that where the, the topolo topology of shape is composed of, of smaller pieces. And so we might, that's really called finite element in, a, in other contexts, so lines are decomposed to segments, polygons and surfaces are decomposed to triangles, and if you have volumes, then they're, they're also decomposed to smaller um, volumes. But there's, there's clear relationships of, of, of meshes to raster and vector data, but there's some sort of key concepts to understand, and the different ways we interpret GIS data. Um, what is a mesh? Really, the, the key thing is that topology is the shape of things and their relationships. Um, and geometry is the where. And really, in GIS, we, t we tend to mix those two together. Like, we tend to talk about 2D is, is X and Y, 3D is X, Y, and Z. But the topology itself can be, is one dimensional. Like, a line segment is one dimensional topology, and a triangle is two dimensional topology. So there's kind of two dimensionality concepts that we, we tend to conflate in GIS, but they're quite separate. And the neat thing about separating topology and geometry is that you, one, you, you, it's, it can be denser, so you don't have to store every vertex more than once if it's shared across features. Um, and the, the key is the, the indexing. This is the, the thing that links them together. When you go to 3D visualisation in R, you absolutely have to do things this way. So it's a key concept. Um, this is as much code as I'll show this morning, but the, what I'm really doing is showing in R that the geometry, I have three points in three-dimensional geometry. So there's, there's an X, Y, and Z value for three points. Um, and the topology is of length two for each line segment. And what this number is, is really the index into that array. So the one and two is the, the first two rows of, of this geometry array. And all that really means is that we use the first vertex once and we use the second vertex twice. But this defines the line segments. And if I stored this line, if I stored like a two-part line in a GIS, then I'd really have four coordinates. Um, and again, that kind of difference between there's dimensionality in geometry and dimensionality in topology. And I think it's really, it's really valuable to keep those concepts separate. Um, what that means in terms of a 3D plot is that really we have exactly the same data whether we use that geometry as a line, two pairs of line segments, or as a closed triangle. And so, like, if I, when I draw the line segments, I have that topology index, but when I draw the triangles, I just have a slightly different way of indexing how those vertices get joined in the primitives. 
And that's a very low-level key concept. Um, I sometimes say to people, we, you know, we do things a bit wrong in geospatial, we miss some opportunities, and really we, we mix up topology and geometry. Polygons are actually equivalent to lines. Like, like when you think about meshes and topology, lines are, like polygons are really just rings, and it's kind of this shortcut in planar geometry that's really fast and efficient and has got us a long way, but it doesn't actually extend into, into higher dimensional forms. Um, and one of the key problems, I think, like 20, 20 or so years of simple features, is that when, it, when the standards were defined, this was practically impossible. But there have been algorithms and methods that have come out in the last few years that are, that are more accessible and allow us to do this. There's more than one way to do it, and there's cheaper and more difficult ways to do this. But that, that on its own is a hard problem. Um, and the other key concept is raster and vector aren't so different when we look at data in this way. Like, it's a kind of unnatural division in GIS to say that raster and vector are completely separate. But when you start looking at meshes and multi-dimensional data, they, they have commonalities that, are, that are really bridge that divide. Um, these are some of the motivations that kind of got me down this, that down this path. Tracks and point clouds, like as Anita was explaining before, it doesn't really fit well in a, in a GIS context. And I think this is part of the problem. We, we, we should be thinking about tracks as connected meshes in more than we do. Um, it's also useful for topology fixes, and I know, you know a lot of the libraries that we use for, for fixing geometries actually use these techniques under the hood, but we don't have express access to them and, unless we use very low-level tools. Um, so in the talk, I'm going into quite a lot of detail about these vector and raster types and how they relate to meshes. Um, but that's, that's enough for, for now. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mike to take now? Plenty of time later on. Um, right, so the uh, last thing that I wanted to do before uh, the coffee break is um, to assign reporters for the final session this afternoon at 4.30. So, so let's go through the sessions. Oh, and to look at who, uh, how many people are going to which session. So let's look at the, uh, let's look at the morning program. Who is going to the GRASS GIS session from Marcus? That that looks that it should that should fit. Who is going to uh, Anita's session movement? That should fit as well in the room that we have. And who is going to Martijn's session on TMAP? Okay, so we don't we shouldn't have capacity problems then in the morning. Same thing for the afternoon. Who is going to Martijn's second session on TMAP? Good, that should fit. Uh, who is going to Michael's session in the afternoon? That should fit. And who is going to Dan Marcus Nadler's session in the afternoon? Good. Okay, that looks good. So it looks, I didn't see any flocks of more than 20, so there might be room for one or two to spontaneously change plans. Um, that, but we want to have reporters for each of the short, short reporters, as we saw. Yesterday, this can be spontaneous, take two minutes, maximally five minutes. Uh, who is going to report on Marcus Nadler's morning session, the GRASS GIS session? And I want to have volunteers who haven't done that so far. At the end of the week, everyone will have done this once or twice. Yeah, cool, perfect. Who is going to do Anita Grass's uh, session on movement data? Briefly report back on that at the end of the day. Coffee break is waiting. Coffee break is waiting.
Yeah, perfect. Good. Thank you for volunteering. Cool. Uh, who is going to report on Martijn Tennekes? Morning meeting? Morning session? The more we do this, the, 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 the smaller a deal will this become, you know, right? So, you know. Great, thank you. Cool, thanks for um, volunteering. Who is um, reporting on, on Martijn Tendica's afternoon meeting? Yes, perfect, thanks. Who will do Michael Sumner's meeting on... Um, cool, Robin, brave. Marcus Nadler's afternoon meeting, Grass TIS, who wants to report on that? It's only brief. Most of the things will have been said by five o'clock. But who will, who volunteers? Yes. It's the, it's the same in the morning, but it's a different group, right? So you get a different group and a different energy, different activity, and you get a different reporter. That's the main thing. So who's going to report on the Grass CIS afternoon session? Cool, thank you. Okay, then we're all set, and thanks all for all the speakers, and have a good coffee break. <laughs>